Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome back after the break. This is the final uh, session of our, or a final panel session, I should say, uh, today, which will run for an hour. Uh, and then we will have a wrap up uh, half hour when two of my colleagues will join me. Um, but before we start, just to say my name is Tom Keating. Uh, I am director of RUSI's Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies. Uh, and it is indeed my great pleasure to chair this final panel session of the day, uh, where we'll look at threat and financial connections. Just to repeat what you've probably been told previously, but if you want to ask a question, do please pose it in writing in the Q&A box and do include your name and organizational affiliation, just so we can sort of answer it with that in mind. And I believe you can also upvote questions that you're particularly keen to hear from the panel um, about. So just before we start, and as today's conference involves a wide range of uh, participants, you may not all be familiar with the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI. So I'm just going to briefly explain who we are and why uh, it makes perfect sense for a think tank dedicated to defense and security to include a program on finance such as ours. So finance is very often a thread that runs through domestic and international security threats, whether that's the funding of terrorist acts, whether that is the underlying profit motive of organized crime, or increasingly the financing of the threat posed by hostile state activity. So put simply, we uh, style ourselves as a specialist research program within RUSI that's focused on the intersection of finance and security. And one of the things, of course, we do is seek to convene the right cross-section of brains to consider the challenges posed by finance and security. And that, of course, we have done uh, again today, I'm sure you will agree. So following on from the previous discussions at this afternoon's conference, the focus of this session then is to consider the on and offline fundraising strategies uh, and international financial connections of the far right. Much of the international security discourse on far right financing has sought to apply to the threat threat, the same responses that have been developed over 20 years of combating financing related to the jihadi threat posed by Al Qaeda, Islamic State and other related groups. Question, does this make sense or do we need to take a more nuanced approach to addressing the finances to support far right extremism and terrorism? Well, I suspect you can guess what our view is on that, but hopefully that will emerge um, in a more substantiated way during the course of this discussion. So to explore all this and more over the next hour, I'm delighted to be joined by a suitably expert panel. First off, we will hear from my colleague, Stephen Reimer. Stephen is a research fellow in our Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies and leads our threat finance cluster. Uh, along with Stephen, we are delighted to be joined by Bethan Johnson, doctoral fellow at the Center for the Analysis of the Radical Right and author of a 2020 briefing on far-right financing for RUSI's, uh, RUSI Europe's Project Craft, which looked at terrorist financing in the EU and much more uh, besides. We're delighted to welcome Jacob Davey, who is Head of Research and Policy of Far Right and Hate Movements at the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. I'm very grateful to Jacob, who's kindly stepped in at the last minute for his colleague, who was sadly not able to join us today for personal reasons. And then last, but certainly by no means least, I was delighted to welcome from the US, Brenna Smith, the Visual Investigations Fellow at the New York Times and a dedicated investigator of far right use of cryptocurrencies. So we'll hear from each of the speakers for five to seven minutes. Uh, and while you're listening, again, do please be sure to add your comments and questions in the Q&A box, and we will be sure to get to those in the second half of our session. So with all that said, I am delighted to pass the floor to Stephen. Stephen. Thank you so much, Tom, and welcome everybody to this panel on fret financing. Um, as Tom said, I'm a research fellow at the CFCS, and I spend a lot of my time looking at terrorism financing modalities understanding terrorism financing threats, but I also do some work on capacity building in different parts of Europe and the Middle East on strengthening the private sector's response to terrorism financing. So when it comes to far right financing, financing, it's kind of interesting to think about how lots of these architectures and structures that we have, um, how applicable are they to, to this kind of uh, you know, extremist or terrorist threat. And I'm also really excited to be speaking today at a, a counterterrorism conference and not a counterterrorism financing or financial crime sort of conference. It's a really welcome change of audience for me because in the world that I normally occupy, uh, what, what would normally happen on this kind of panel is we'd have lots of staff uh, in the compliance departments of different banks who'd be asking us, please tell us all of the red flags and the indicators that we can, that we can identify to, talk, to, to, to point out 
typologies of far-right financing. And that's actually really quite difficult to do and very dependent on a particular orthodoxy that we have when we think about what terrorism financing is and what is the job of counterterrorism financing, this regime that we have. Um, so at this counterterrorism conference, I hope that we can even throw out the book a little bit when it comes to considering whether counterterrorism financing as a concept is even particularly useful or appropriate at all when it comes to countering the financing of frets. That's a pretty radical idea um, in the world that I usually occupy. So I'm looking forward to talking about it today on this panel. Um, but first of all, what is counterterrorism financing? It might be something that some participants here are less familiar with. Um, in a nutshell, after the attacks in, in, in the United States on September 11th, we had uh, you know, a series of actions that were taken to essentially apply uh, an existing model of countering uh, financial crime and apply that to countering the financing of terrorism. So we had different tools and approaches that have been used um, to counter money laundering, known as the AML or anti-money laundering regime, uh, using those tools and approaches to detect and hopefully halt the financial flows that were supporting transnational jihadi terrorism, the likes of which uh, perpetrated the 9-11 attacks. And this um, anti-money laundering approach really fell into two sort of domains of activity. The first domain of activity has to do with, you know, identifying the behaviors of individuals. So these responsibilities largely fell to the private sector. So financial institutions expected to take the data and information that they have about their customers and identify financial behaviors that looked like the financing of terrorism. And then crucially to identify that behavior and then to report it to what is called a financial intelligence unit, which exists at the national level um, in almost every country through what's called a suspicious activity report. So the bank would identify that potentially uh, terrorist financing activity and report that to the public sector via NSTR. The second domain of, of the sort of anti-money laundering approach to countering terrorism financing is about the, the identification of terrorist groups. And what this really is, is designations, designating groups uh, as a terrorist organization. The consequence of that being that members or indeed any kind of supporter of that sanctioned group would have their assets frozen and uh, crucially they would be subject to a travel ban. This process of uh, identifying groups or uh, designations was really a process led at the UN Security Council level. And this is quite helpful for the transnational jihadi threat because it has a global applicability and global reach. When a group is designated as a terrorist group at the UN Security Council, it has universal applicability. Um, so it sounds great for countering the jihadi threat, but we're here to look at the far right extremism terrorism threat. What are the problems with these two domains when it comes to countering that kind of activity? Well, to start off, we have very few designations of far right groups as terrorist entities. Um, Canada has designated a handful, including the Proud Boys, and the UK has designated several, including indigenous groups like uh, uh, National Action. Um, crucially, the United States has only, to my knowledge, designated one far right group as a terrorist group, and this is the Russian Imperial Movement. And there's several reasons for this, which I think are quite important. In the United States, the process for designating um, any kind of uh, extreme, any kind of terrorist group, um, uh, any kind of domestic uh, group, can only be done through one of several uh, designations processes, and that is under the process uh, set out by Executive Order 13224, which is established, which is uh, an executive order that was signed by President Bush immediately after 9/11, all about countering terrorism financing. And even then, groups that are uh, wholly dom domiciled in the United States and whose members are American citizens, uh, those groups can only be designated as a terror organization under this regime if they are deemed to be acting as agents of a foreign-based group. So the United States sanctions sanctioning regime for terrorism really has this foreign uh, uh, element to it. There needs to be some kind of foreign connection. And for the far right in the US, that's a major impediment to, to sanctioning uh, these groups. Um, and I think it, it, it's fair to say that unlike you know, the jihadist terrorist uh, networks, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, even Hezbollah, um, where the brand of Hezbollah and the brand of Al-Qaeda is, is so essential, um, the sort of networks of smaller groups uh, on the far right in the transatlantic space, I think are more, more able to ditch their name and to regroup and reformulate under, under different configurations, which makes sanctioning and designating groups you know, a, lot a lot more difficult. And designations are so important when it comes to the counterterrorism financing regime, because that toolbox of, of asset freezing, travel bans, uh, is only opened after a designation has been made. And anything short of that, so anybody that's merely an extremist group, even potentially violent extremist groups, 
uh, fall outside the scope of our counterterrorism financing regime. That means their assets are not frozen and they're still able to travel. And that, uh, that permission to travel facilitates some of the transatlantic uh, coordination and connections that I'm, I'm sure we've spoken about in earlier panels today. So in the last just few uh, minutes I have, we have not many designations that are being done at the public sector, but what is the private sector doing? Um, many members of the private sector, especially the new technologies kind of, kind of areas, whether that's uh, crowdfunding platforms or, or social media companies, they're increasingly expected to respond to far-right extremism and terrorism. And some larger platforms like uh, Facebook have their own designations list, which, uh, which they, they use in order to, to, to determine which groups they're going to um, uh, take off of their platform or to pursue actions against. Facebook's designations list was leaked just a, a few weeks ago, and it includes lots of far-right groups that the United States and other, and other countries haven't designated. Um, those, as I said, those, those lists are used to decide who they're going to take off their platform, and it's also used to determine whether content that's being posted onto social media platforms or even you know, items that are being sold on commerce websites, whether those uh, violate you know, the community standards of a particular platform. Uh, which is essentially the law of the land on, on, on a, particular, uh, a particular site. Um, there are some consequences to, to choosing to deplatform or to remove content from, from far-right groups. Um, the first is platform migration. So if I'm a neo-Nazi organization trying to sell my content, uh, you know, t-shirts, memorabilia, that sort of thing, on an e-commerce platform and I'm shut down, this may cause me to migrate into uh, less mature platforms where my activity can go perhaps more unnoticed. Um, but to, then you also have the potential for financial intelligence to be lost. For every transaction that would have been made between me, a potential supporter, and um, a far-right group that's selling, uh, selling things, um, that financial intelligence and opportunities to, to, to capture that and, and to use it to hopefully dismantle or identify groups is lost. Um, so we have a private sector response that's really based on reputational risk and trying to mitigate uh, you know, perceived connections between Members of the private sector and um, unsavory, albeit not sanctioned or uh, illegal groups. Um, and this isn't a adequate insurance policy for making sure that far right extremism and terrorism isn't, isn't uh, being financed. But without those designations that I've spoken so much about, the counterterrorism financing regime isn't really able to do that either. So that's that's really the challenge I wanted to set out for, for, for my co-panelists here today and for everyone to think about in their questions. Um, if the CTF regime is perhaps not best calibrated to deal with this threat, do we have something else we might need to try when it comes to far-right financing? And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Stephen, thanks very much. Uh, I think you've set a thorny challenge. Um, so first, perhaps to think about that and to share her thoughts with us, I will pass now to Bethan. Well, thank you very much. And that is quite a daunting task. Thank you, Stephen. I would expect nothing less from you having worked with you um, previously and had an amazing time. I want to start also by saying um, I'm always grateful to come and speak with Rusi and its members. I uh, started this um, work that I do on, on the financial element of terrorism. Actually, sort of by happenstance, several years ago, I was interested in uh, far right music um, and found that there was actually a lot of money floating around therein. Um, and from there sort of developed uh, that area of expertise, which I've been fortunate enough to have funded as um, Tom has mentioned. Um, and so I'll speak to some of the issues that Stephen had as well as some other ones that I wanna highlight. It sounds kind of trite or cliche at this point, 18 months or however long into a pandemic, but we do need to factor that in whenever we're talking about the issue of financing um, and the radical right or the extreme right. Uh, because a lot of what might be considered more predictive models or um, ideas about what the future would hold in terms of terrorist financing was thrown up in the air, even between when I wrote my work and it was published in 2020 and today. Um, and that is the case for works previous as well. Um, but more generally speaking, one of the things that I wanted to highlight is that often I find in uh, studies of terrorism, in addition to a, what might be argued as a sort of overemphasis on the applicability of uh, counterterrorism financing um, ideologies, practices in terms of uh, Salafi jihadism and its role with the radical right. Um, I think there's also a great deal of breakdown or uh, break of, breaking away or parsing out of um, looking at how the entire scope of financial um, dealings for the radical right. Often you'll see articles or pieces of work that will focus just on 
um, fundraising or just on how money is spent. And there's much less of an emphasis on financing as a holistic process that, that there is not just one avenue that needs to be explored, but that you really need to integrate them to understand how these um, individuals and organizations operate um, in the financial world, but also in the real world. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to emphasize as well is that uh, far right financing is extremely context driven. Um, and uh, that's something that Stephen mentions in terms of um, changing platforming, being responsive to de platforming. Um, but this we can see even um, prior to the sort of tech age. So it used to be, for instance, that the far right would gain a lot of its financial holdings uh, and individuals on the radical right or the far right would spend a lot of their money on things like membership fees to be part of an organization or to purchase official goods that were linked to extremism being on a newsletter or other things or they engaged in tithing, which I mentioned in, in the piece of work that I did um, with Rusi. And that has largely changed, particularly with the advent of what's known as accelerationism um, and lone wolf terrorist thought. Um, so the idea is to move away from organizational structures and towards sort of individual affiliated um, nodes within a larger network. So you don't need necessarily to pay a membership fee anymore or even to be part of a group. So that is something in which the ideology has driven a change in the spending of these um, these individuals and these entities. Um, at the same time, you have responses to tech to updates, as we've said. So uh, things shifted, for instance, from putting content behind paywalls um, and monetizing content in other ways um, towards crowdfunding, um, as well as then eventually crypto. Um, so again, the far right has been in raising money and spending money, really trying to get ahead of the curve or be at the sort of very forefront of things. Um, that being said, I think there is a strong emphasis um, on the, in, the degree of um, integration between technology and financial planning and spending of these groups. But I think it's important to say there are lots of non-tech ways in which the 21st century radical right is still operating. So you, I, like I said, uh, became interested because of concerts and music, which have been a fundraising staple for many, many years. Um, but you also have things like bars and clubs that are affiliated with organizations or ideologies that help raise money because the owner of that establishment um, will fund some of, will put some of the money that they raise into um, terrorist movements. That's particularly true in Eastern European contexts I have found where there are um, well-known clubs that have owners who are affiliated with things like Azov Battalion or other movements. Um, again, you see a uh, fashion and memorabilia, those pieces of clothing that you see people wear, the flags that they're flying don't sort of, they're not sitting at home selling them themselves. That's uh, an entire industry in and of itself. Um, and outside of that, you see things like fight nights, um, fight training. That is something that is um, a cost to individuals and a fundraising opportunity for organizations. And the final one that I wish we talked about more, and I, if I had more time, I would go on and on about it, is this concept of doomsday prepping, which is particularly um, recent um, as, as COVID-19 has sort of integrated and made people feel like a doomsday or an apocalypse or a race war is coming. Um, there are certain individuals and actors who are um, capitalizing on that in a literal term. Um, so again, I think we need to look at these things in a holistic manner. So when an individual is spending money, um, they often are spending it um, in concert with, or they're buying memorabilia or they're buying items or buying training that someone else is selling. And so you need to look at both sides of that exchange and why is someone selling it? Why is someone purchasing it? And how can we potentially figure out what um, ideologically might drive an individual to engage in those kind of transactions? aside from just being able to literally track it. Um, all this to say, I just want to round out by saying a bit about what COVID might do um, or might not do. I think there is this belief that maybe everything will be totally different when uh, COVID uh, hopefully eventually leaves us and we'll go back to the way it was. That I don't think is the case. I would argue that um, the radical right was already on a trajectory away from many of its normal financial transactions, the ones that are easier to trace. Um, 
So I think that this is just exacerbated or accelerated to use their own term, many of those issues. Um, and a lot of counter-terrorist financing needs to be responsive to that, that the idea is we can't just go back to tracking concerts and expect that will help us figure out um, where radicalization is happening and who is doing the radicalizing. Um, at the same time, just to speak to uh, Stephen's point just for a second, uh, we also need to realize that red flags are not always gonna exist, that uh, we see lots of right-wing tax that are uh, conducted by or being plotted by individuals who are not spending the kind of money that any institution could reasonably track. Um, you just need a knife or a vehicle or a gun and trying to m figure out how to preemptively um, identify those red flags might not be possible. And so we may need to also reorient our thinking um, towards less of a preventative measure and more of a informational investigative manner in the future to say, how can we, how can we use whatever fundraising we or funding or spending we find um, to figure out connections between this actor and another, as opposed to saying, if I can find the fertilizer, I can find the bomb, or if I can do this, I'll be able to find that. Um, and I think that that should be something that we think about more and more frequently as we come into a more open period in our COVID, post-COVID world, um, is that terrorist and extremism, terrorism and extremism are going away, and we need to think about how to be responsive to what the radical right will do, um, just in the same way that they're responsive to the changing nature of technology and, and other things. Um, but that's all for me. I really hope to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and don't fault me if some of my stuff from Rusi has changed in a post-COVID world or a current COVID world. But I'm really grateful and I hope to answer any questions you may have. Great, Bethan, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Yes, this whole question around, as you say, looking for red flags or using the information, I think is something we might want to talk about. I, I have to say, I listened to a really interesting podcast this morning on the way to work about doomsday prepping, all about the North Idaho Redoubt, which I had heard nothing about, uh, but now I feel fully uh, fully expert. And um, if you visit the, the London Times website, there's a very excellent film uh, by a journalist who went and interviewed a whole load of people up there. It's a crazy world you live in, Brenner. But we'll come to you in a minute. Um, Jacob, uh, over to you. Thank you again for, for joining us. I pass the floor to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks everyone for the really fascinating contributions so far. Um, unlike others on this call and this, this panel, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert specifically focusing on funding and terrorist financing. My focus is much more broadly on the online strategies of the extreme right and of the far right. Um, within that, though, we have done some analysis, which I will pull up and I want to discuss today, looking at that online picture and what that looks like when, when it comes to hate groups and far right groups raising funds. Now, I know I only have five minutes for this, but I have got two slides just to speak to this research. So this I'm going to present very briefly on just two um, studies which we conducted looking at the online funding strategies of far-right groups and hate groups, one in the US and one in Germany. The methodology we used for these was the same. It was based largely by looking at the digital footprint of these groups, then looking at the architecture of their websites, conducting searches of their social media posts, and then also conducting searches associated with these groups on other platforms to build a picture of the ecosystem of which they're raising money. And across both of these studies, there were some trends which cropped up again and again, which I think have some really interesting uh, implications for broader policy discussions. So firstly, to our work on the US, which we did last October, what we did was we analyzed the digital footprints of 73 US-based hate groups and then checked for their use of 54 fundraising mechanisms in total. 49 of these were platforms or platforms which facilitate fundraising like PayPal. Five of these were cryptocurrencies. Now in total, what we found across these was 191 instances of hate groups using online fundraising services to support their activity, either through asking for donations or selling merch. Um, now, when we looked at these platforms, what we found was, okay, a third of them don't have a policy which explicitly prohibits the use of hate groups. Now, obviously, discussion around fundraising platforms and discussion around social, uh, social media platforms will be different. It will have diff difficult uh, implications. And when we're talking about regulation of, say, Facebook and the tech giant, it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate to bring, this, to, to bring fundraising platforms in. 
But importantly, what we did find was um, that, that that means that there are a majority of platforms uh, which do have uh, 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 policies in place which prohibit hate groups. So they've signed up and they've said, okay, we're not going to allow hate groups or extremist groups to use our platforms. Now, regardless of this, we found in 20, out of 24 of those platforms, so 83% of the platforms which actually have policies in place, either against hate speech or extremist use, um, they were still being used. So really what this points towards is kind of a, a two, two policy areas for exploration. On the one hand, what do you do with those platforms which don't have policies in place? Is it appropriate to bring those into broader discussions and online harms? But on the other hand, you actually have an enforcement gap. So you have platforms which have signed up, which have set themselves a code of dot contacts around their, their usage, um, and they're not living up to those. And I think that that's really interesting. We did a similar exercise in Germany and found much the same trends. This was done at a smaller scale. We looked at 17 extreme right-wing groups and we looked at their use of 20 platforms. Here again, 12 of those platforms had terms of service prohibiting their use by hate groups. They were all being used by hate groups and all being used by extremist groups. So again, this evidence is this enforcement gap. There were other points which come down the line, which come down the line, which are interesting more broadly though, both in this study and in the study in the US. So the most commonly used funding mechanism in German groups was the online solicitation of bank transfers. So actively encouraging people to send you bank transfers the old fashioned way. Now, this doesn't, this isn't governed by terms of service. This doesn't have a terms of service. So again, it suggests that these groups are looking for gaps in and opportunities for, to net themselves funds. Interestingly, we also sort of saw the, the, this, this trend again in the, in the US. So <clears throat> when we look, what we did was we broke down the hate groups, um, most of which exhibited far right tendencies or meta definition of far right um, into subcategories. So looking at those which were anti-immigrant, those which were anti-Muslim, those associated with the militia movement, white nationalists, white supremacists. Now, broadly speaking, there was this trend where for most of these groups, they used a smattering of different types. So they used flexible fund collection, um, crowdfunding campaigns, on-site retail, on-site donation forms. What really bucked the trend here were white supremacists who um, rarely used these more public means of tra uh, bank transfer, um, but were by far and away the most prolific users of cryptocurrency. Now, these were also the groups which are most affiliated or most associated with violent activity, the siege culture, the accelerationist tendencies, which we've heard so much before, which again points to this trend, which others on this call have spoken to, of, of groups, you know, as they uh, perhaps <clears throat> Um, uh, gain a reputation and gain gain attention more broadly and are shut down from more mainstream platforms trying to seek the less regulated spaces. The only other thing which I wanted to draw very quickly from this, which was quite interesting, was this charity aggregation. And actually, what we found was in the US context, a number of far right groups, including white nationalist groups, including white supremacist groups and militia groups. This includes the Oath Capers, who actually who were involved in the January 6th insurrection, have charitable status and nonprofit status in the US, which actually means that they're brought into these charity aggregated platforms and people can donate to them as you would to a cancer research charity. I just pose that as another interesting thought, particularly as if we're looking at this as a whole spectrum. So not just looking at the terrorist side or the violent extremist side of the extreme right, but actually that broader radical right gamut. So thank you very much. I hope that gives some food for thought around the uh, policy implications here. Jacob, thank you very much. That was, uh, there was a lot in there. It was very succinct and a few things for us to discuss, but you um, uttered the, uh, the crypto word. And so that's a perfect segue uh, to Brenna. So over to you for some initial thoughts, Brenna. Brenna. Hi, all. Yeah, I'm like, shoot, I have to follow Jacob now. And he had fancy slides and everything. And you just have to listen to my rambling. So sorry about that. But I'm so excited to be here. I've been a huge Rusi fan for years now. And even though right now in my current role as a fellow at the Times, I'm not spending as much time in the crypto world. Typically, it's where I live. So I'm really excited to be back here and to nerd out with you all for a bit. Um, what I wanted to spend my like five or so minutes mainly focusing on was the differences between crypto financing between far the far right groups and then the more classical terrorism financing that we're all more familiar with. Um, Jacob covered a lot of um, stuff that I think overlapped some with my presentation, so I won't bore you with that because he did it in 
such a brilliant way that, you know, it doesn't really, I, he did it better than I would have explained it. However, what I do think bears in mind that's interesting between the difference between far right and um, terrorism groups is this idea of the fact that they do have more access than many terrorist organizations because they don't have sanctions, which is kind of harkening back to what uh, Stephen was talking about before. So because they don't have as much actual law forbidding them from financing on mainstream platforms, they're able to take advantage of that. The difference between them and terrorists, though, that is kind of key right now is that um, their far right groups are very um, at the whim of the news cycles. So, for example, I've been tracking crypto use for the far right since about 2017. And in that time, Charlottesville happened. And so when Charlottesville happened, a lot of far right groups were cut off from mainstream funding platforms, at least momentarily, because of the whole, you know, PR news blitz around Charlottesville occurring. And that's when I started to see them kind of flock more towards crypto, which, which was an interesting phenomenon, because basically the PayPal's and the um, GoFundMe's of the world were essentially trying to enforce these content moderation policies of who could use their platforms. And then when you saw by the time Jan January 6th was coming back was that a lot of the far right groups that had initially been cut off from those platforms had kind of trickled their way back into them. And then when January 6th happened, they were once again, a lot of their accounts were taken down and there was alleged content moderation around that. Um, after January 6th, it was more enforced that had become laxed after Charlottesville. So there's kind of like this ebb and there's this, this, what I'm trying to say is there's like a cycle that I've noticed between far right groups becoming more interested in crypto, at least in the US context, because of when they don't have access to mainstream platforms, which kind of makes sense why they would want to use mainstream platforms more than any other place because of who their base is. And it's just easier to explain to people how to use it. But now is another time after January 6th where they are having more issues using those mainstream platforms. So they're starting to kind of take a page out of the terrorism financing playbook and to try to start educating their base on how to use crypto. And it's interesting to see the ways that they go about it and how it's similar and different to terrorism. Um, a lot of the times they're starting to kind of flock to similar platforms to advertise fundraising, specifically like Bitcoin addresses and Ethereum addresses and stuff like that. There's a lot of Telegram groups. There are some personal websites. Um, and there's also a little bit of dark web activity, but I would say there's still significantly more dark web terrorism activity compared to the far right right now, at least for a crypto fundraising perspective. But on those platforms, they're sending like guides on how to use cryptocurrency and they're trying to educate their base on the basics of the technology and how to essentially, you know, send money to them and which are the best exchanges with the least regulation that they can send that money to. Um, and that's something that terrorists have been doing for years. And it's a really interesting crossover to see. But something that I do want to keep in mind is that I do think that there are really key differences between far-right fundraising and terrorism fundraising in the sense of there are a lot of, for lack of a better term, quote-unquote far-right influencers in the space versus terrorism. Like you will never see, I have not, I shouldn't say that, but I personally have never seen an individual terrorist have any sort of online account on Telegram or any sort of semi-social media platform where they're promoting an, a crypto address for their individual use. And you see that all the time in the far right space. You see it all the time, the individuals who are an oath keeper or a proud boy having a personal website, personal, you know, parlor pages and different stuff like that with the, or like bit shoots, bit shoot, like kind of like platforms where they, they, you know, like the platforms that they started to create that are kind of like analogous to YouTube or Facebook or different stuff like that, but they're not actually those mainstream platforms. Um, but there'll be individuals who are really semi-celebrities in those movements who will be promoting their own individual crypto fundraising addresses. Um, and I think that's a key difference because a lot of these guys are relying on this technology to help fund their lifestyle costs, it's to help fund their lives. Um, and that I think is really interesting because you don't see it in a terrorism financing perspective, but it also leads a lot of different questions into how the money is being used because there's just not a lot of clear perspective. It's like, is this money actually being used to help like fund or further the movement? Like they're saying it is, or is it being used to like pay off their car or to buy a car or, you know, their lifestyle costs? Um, 
And so I think that what we're going to keep on seeing with the far right for crypto financing is that we'll see it becoming ebbing and flowing of it being more popular and less popular if they're not able to find those gaps in regulation on mainstream fundraising platforms. Because especially in the U.S., their average far right supporter is not necessarily a tech savvy person. So they're going to want to make it as easy as possible for their supporters to send them money. And if they're not able, and crypto is a much more difficult platform to be able to explain to people how to use compared to PayPal or whatnot. However, the catch side of that is, you know, as more, for example, maybe sanctions or um, pressure is put on regulators and technology companies to crack down on far-right usage, if that pressure is consistent enough and doesn't ebb and flow, like the time between Charlottesville and January 6th, that could change. But not only that, I think that there will be also crypto technology platforms that will continue to crop up um, over time that will make it a lot easier and more intuitive for users to use crypto. And then it'll be even more of an asset to these far-right influencers and far-right groups. Um, yeah, so that's mainly what I wanted to say. Brenna, thanks. Um, thanks so much. I wanted to ask you a question straight off the bat, actually, on something you you said there. Um, I mean, and and the others should feel free to raise your hand if you want to chip in. Um, to what extent do you think the donors that give uh, money to these influencers, as as you call it, to what extent do you think they realise or care what the money is being used for? So, you know, if the money is being used to pay off um, a car loan, uh, I'm not sure I'd be that psyched about that. Uh, but if the money is being used to, you know, propagate uh, a narrative, then yeah, okay, I'd be happy to, to fund that. Any any sense of, of whether people are aware or care about what the money is being used for? You know, it's really hard to tell because on all the hours that I've spent um, looking at how different people are talking about various far right influencers in comments or about promoting their work online as you know they're 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 seen like celebrities like they talk about them like celebrities sometimes and it's it's not always there's not always an overlap between this idea of like I feel like a lot of people who support various jihadi movements they are very aligned because of the ideological background of it and that's not always going to be the case for the far right there's actually like a celebrity and a face who they really like and so they um, want to support them as an individual, even if they do likely overlap ideologically as well. So I think that it would just have to depend on the donor. Like some people, if they really believe that this person is a leader of the movement they care about, I'm sure they would be upset to learn that this is going to lifestyle costs instead of furthering infrastructure for Oath Keepers or Proud Boys. But if somebody's just really obsessed with like Enrique Terrio, then like, you know, maybe they don't care as much as what he uses it for and they just want to support him more so than maybe the movement he's representing. Great, great. Uh, yeah, Jacob, you were nodding violently, which is, and you put your hand up, so come in, sir. Very briefly, I just think there's a, an interesting analogy here. So when I look at uh, hate groups and influencers in the US, right, a lot of them are using live streaming platforms which have donations. Now, other people who use live streaming platforms like people who game, like I'm going to show myself playing Minecraft to people, right? And people find it entertaining and they'll donate money. I really think it's the analogy there. If someone's donating to their favorite gaming streamer, do you really think they care if it's going to go to a new car or not? It's there to keep them in the lifestyle. And I think that for some of these influences, that's just very much the same point. Great. Yeah, no, that makes makes perfect sense. I wanted to go sort of back in a way to, to first principles and perhaps Beth and I'll um, uh, direct this question to you initially, Stephen. You might have a view as well. The the on the traditional terrorist financing side, I think you often hear political leaders uh, feeling that you know if we can identify the funds uh, of uh, the funding streams of terrorists, we can cut those off. It will have an impact on the activity of the terrorist group. We can debate whether that's actually the case or not. But to what extent uh, do we think that finance is important to to these to these groups? You know, how it is 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 starving them whether they're designated as terrorist organizations or whether they're 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 extremists is is that a strategy that we should be pursuing from a security pers perspective bethan uh yes thank you so i think that uh my my feeling on this issue is essentially that it is 
part of a toolkit. It is not going to be the silver bullet that deals with this, especially as the ideology shifts away from groups and towards individuals and, and the kinds of attacks that people are aspiring to perpetrate, which don't necessarily require large amounts of funding. Um, so I think as I sort of explained or mentioned, at least accelerationism is increasingly embraced by certain members of the radical right. And basically that's the argument that if a sufficient number of terror attacks can be perpetrated in quick succession, it will trigger race wars. And that, that quick succession component is really important. And those are not about having one large 9-11 type attack, but a series of them over time. And so those don't require nearly as much um, large scale funding. And because of that, I think this idea that if we can just cut people off, they won't be able to perpetrate these kinds of extremism or these kinds of attacks isn't necessarily accurate. You would have to essentially make it impossible for them to go into a store and purchase a knife or purchase uh, a rent a car or use their own car to your car payment analogy from previously. Um, or even things like you would then also have an intersection in the US with gun ownership and can people buy guns? Can we, like, how would that work? Um, and the regulations therein. So I think that the idea that if we can just identify where the money comes from and cut that stream off is sort of a false herring of sorts, especially when um, looking at individuals who often use their own money. They don't necessarily crowdsource or they don't fundraise in any way, they use their wages from their normal jobs um, in order to do this. And so it would be very difficult in many instances for us to be able to track um, the, the money. It's never as overt as someone is saying like, I am fundraising for this violence or to publish this book that will encourage people to commit violence. It's often more covert and is increasingly as we shift, like I said, from organizations to individuals, something where people are self-financing even through their everyday mainstream jobs. So I just don't necessarily see it as very feasible. I think that it would be one and increasingly less and less helpful element of a larger toolkit. Okay, thanks so much. Stephen? Yeah, I think Bethan and I are on the same wavelength here. And in, in, I think cutting off funding streams would have a security implication in the sense that the sort of terrorism financing or threat financing of of organizations to the extent that that financing helps that organization or the individuals in that organization kind of create an extremist milieu so it's like kind of the dissemination of propaganda and like the creating of the content that individual would be lone actors then engage with and inspires them to then carry out their own attack uh, with their own financing, as, as Bethan was saying. So I think it's important to look at the sort of um, the organizational uh, terrorism financing or threat financing in the sense of, um, I'm, you know, far-right groups uh, gain money that they then use to, uh, you know, to fund their propaganda campaigns and, and, to, and to host events. But then when it comes to operational financing, operational terrorism financing for the far-right, that kind of goes into the lone actor, um, lone actor financing of, Loan actor financing, where 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 uh, attacks are financed by, by you know people's individual uh, wages or, or other or other small amounts of money. So I think the finance is relevant, but perhaps in an indirect way, or at least not directly related to to what's used to to plan attacks. Okay, well, while you're there, Stephen, I, and I want to kind of think about the private sector a little bit because I think um, that that obviously there are a lot of questions in the private sector about you know what are they meant to do here. There's a yeah. question from a participant who says, you know, do, do we think perhaps that law enforcement should create or there should be created some, I think they described it as designation light list, uh, mm -hmm. where far right organizations are on a list, they may not be subject to designation, mm -hmm. uh, that would encourage perhaps um, the private sector to file suspicious transaction reports, and thus we would perhaps build up a better picture, intelligence picture of the financial activity of, of, of these, these groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good question. I think in theory, it would, I mean, as, as this kind of scenario is set up, it, it could actually create the financial intelligence um, uh, as described. However, I think this question is really about the communication of strategic security priorities from the public sector to the private sector. And there's certain, you know, countries in the transatlantic space that are able to do this. And I think France has a sort of... Um, a setup in terms of its, uh, you know, threat finance, um, the powers of the financial intelligence unit to 
you know, name or, or, or sorry, to request financial institutions to send STRs as, as, as was framed in the question, to send STRs in that way and, and to not necessarily deplatform individuals. But um, I mean, the helpful thing about a terrorism designation is that it then designates an individual. So if I'm on the terrorist list, it'll be Stephen Reimer, date of birth, 15 November, 1991. Here's my passport number. It's the kind of like very clear information that the compliance officer at the bank will use when, when onboarding me or when screening their, their customer list. So they say, oh, this guy's on the sanctions list. We have to remove him. So unless the bank or the fintech or you know the, the online platform, whatever it is, is able to identify me, I should stop referring to myself as a far-right terrorist, is able to identify an individual as, um, as a member of a you know, sort of designated light group. They can maybe do that through adverse media screening or other kind of soft tools. Um, unless they are able to do that, this kind of situation may not be super effective. I think the question does really underline the importance of the public sector needs to really drive um, this this financial intelligence collection you know, strategy. They need to be telling the private sector what they need to be looking for in a more nuanced way than just sending over another list of, of, of indicators or red flags. It's a lot more um, nuanced and complicated than that, especially as we move towards you know, loan actor financing, as Bethany was talking about. Okay, I'm going to come to sort of tech and crypto in a second. So Brenna and Jacob, stand by. But before we do that, I'm going to go to Bethan. But one point I would make uh, on that is, of course, there is kind of a designation light list out there already, which is the negative media screening. Uh, so certainly banks are on top of what's being reported in the press and other reputable outlets. And so, of course, if they see mention of a group that perhaps has uh, connections with the far right or, or individuals, you know, they're not necessarily going to wait until a name appears on a designation list before taking some form of action, although that might be a closing of account and then a loss of the intelligence opportunity. Um, Bethan, you wanted to come in. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to propose the idea or to insert in there. It is my perception based off of what I have learned from studying terrorism is that other there are some countries in the world that have a kind of gradation list with regards to uh, extremist groups that lead into terrorist groups. And there is within the intelligence community ability to do that. So whilst in the UK, for instance, we have designated groups, there are other um, pieces of language, other uh, legal structures in which uh, individuals can be um, monitored that aren't necessarily raised to the level of um, full-blown designation as a terrorist entity. So this idea um, that in the US and in other countries, for instance, that like there's such a huge threshold to attain that and that's a necessary step, we need to also maybe potentially deconstruct that and say there might be benefits um, to having more of a gradation system um, coming from the government and not just from uh, financial entities or media entities or from social media platforms, because Facebook uh, does it, for instance, um, in terms of stoplights or YouTube as well is quite popular for that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, Brenna, so turn to you, there are a few questions about kind of different forms of crypto and the risks of crypto and how that might um, impact people's use. So I guess uh, to, to, to break that down, is there any, do you, do you have any sense of are there particular forms of cryptocurrency that are more popular or less popular with the far right community? And secondly, um, you know, do people just accept the volatility of cryptocurrency and hold it uh, as, as is, or is there a kind of cash out? And of course, if there's cash out, again, that's another opportunity for the, the private sector exchanges and so on increasingly to, to pay attention to what's going on. So yeah, it's just some thoughts around that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is going to be kind of an ever evolving question, especially um, as crypto just becomes more mainstream in society in general, which, in, you know, it, it already kind of has. When I spend time looking at these quote unquote influencers or just far right groups in general, they do promote more than just Bitcoin. Like they oftentimes will have more crypto addresses out there. However, from the little activity that I've been able to really make sense of extensively, what I can tell you is that even if they get money, say they ask for Ethereum or like even Dogecoin or whatever, Monero privacy coins where you can't necessarily have a public blockchain to track it is much more of a difficult question to look into. So far, there are some places that are some people who are more excited about privacy coins, but they're not using it as much yet because it's harder to use and explain to a person how to use it. But no matter what, 
if they are given a different type of cryptocurrency, usually they will then transfer it back to Bitcoin and then they will cash out from Bitcoin. And from what I can tell, they are quite quick to cash out, especially the influencers, which is the groups, because like we said, the influencers are likely almost certainly using this for lifestyle costs. So, I mean, I think right now the way to look at it is like crypto is just another avenue for them to get cash and they're not necessarily looking at it from a more robust investment perspective of like a stock where they hold for a really long time um i do think that this equation could change over time but i think that the other thing that's almost smart on their part to be still relying on the bitcoin to cashing out perspective is that um for far right groups and far right individuals in general, there's still like a lot less regulation legally around if they're allowed to have be part of these institutions. Like they're legally allowed to have bank accounts. They're legally allowed to be part of these things. If they're not actively advertising a specific address for far right causes, how can payment platforms know for sure that they're, you know, using their payment platform for a bad reason. Like there's a lot legally they have a lot less grounds to be able to completely cut off an individual for that reason. Um and also like if one account gets shut down, they just make a new one. And usually it's it's kind of a whack-a-mole game for these content moder for these payment platforms. And so it's um it's a complex game right now. I think it will evolve over time. But um, I, I think that right now Bitcoin is still definitely king in that world. Great. Uh, thanks for that. J- Jacob, I wanted to, to turn to you for the last few minutes we, we have, or at least to make sure we cover this whole question around how we inform tech platforms. How do we get tech platforms on, on side here? I mean, obviously your research suggests that perhaps they're aware, but not, not, uh, not as active on the issue as, um, as, as some some would some would like um what what's been you i suppose your experience of engaging with tech platforms to try and understand what the enforcement challenge is so i guess like if you look at this more broadly and understand the the challenges around platforms and we look here at social media platforms writ large and digital platforms now i think in a number of cases, the challenge there is actually the will and the case of them to measure up their profit making capability against the risk which they have to their customer. We see this time and time again for the Facebook groups, for example. But and I think that itself makes a very compelling case for regulation when we're looking at that broader online harm con- online harms context. But I don't think that fully and necessarily translates to this very specific question. I think Brenna covered this really well when talking about individuals. Does a financial platform, does a PayPal button know that this is an individual who is making, just using it for personal uses or personal or for extremist uses? What I would say here is this is uh, when we looked at uh, our platforms and when we found that actually the bulk of them did have policies which they weren't weren't enforcing the recommendation there is just enforce them better and we see this consistently when you look at other harms right there's just a gap between enforcement and again and a, and a, uh, a gap between the policies which they set themselves which the standards to which they publicly hold themselves accountable to and to uh and to the reality on the ground and my advice uh, there in the fun- in the sort of financial space is, um, and in the fundraising space is resource that better, make sure that you have got better internal intelligence or you're looking more broadly at what's coming out of academia, what's coming out of um, other research and make sure that you are applying your, applying your policies um, effectively. I think we're in a slightly more sort of tricky question here though, when we're talking about regulation. So the online harms bill, which is going through the UK Parliament, I guess it's 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 talking about having a duty of care to to your users. Now, if it's someone who's making money, I think it's a bit more difficult to actually see where the harm is for the individual user. I think there could potentially be a case if you're selling like you know copies of Siege, say, off the top of my head, right? Then then actually there, there's a direct harm, but but it's, it becomes a little bit um, more more grayer. So I think the the way to to address this, particularly in the extremism space and looking into terrorism, is actually through through public pressure. And if we agree that it's it's not it's it's not correct that these groups are making money online, um, then if platforms have said we're we're not going to stand for this, then make sure that they're enforcing it. Make sure you're holding them to account. And if platforms aren't, then encourage them as much as you can, because it's ultimately in their image and their public, in their interest of their public image, um, to to introduce those terms of service. 
Great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, there's a, a really interesting question, uh, and this might be the last one we've got time for. So I'll make it a, a jump ball, as you would say, uh, in the United States, um, which is to what extent do we think um, that there is funding of hate groups or violent, violent far right groups in Europe and the US by third state actors? Um, I was struck reading uh, the papers today that um, uh, one of the French presidential candidates has just received a very large loan, loan, I don't know if it's a loan or a donation, but anyway, from uh, from Russia. Uh, and that, of course, is the far right uh, candidate. So any any views from any of the panelists, anyone wants to stick their head above the parapet and and, and give us a sense of you know, to what extent are, are these agitators um, receiving funding that is, if you like, state directed, or at least from people who uh, want to cause uh, trouble in the United States or in, in, in Europe from an interstate perspective. Brenna. I'll be really quick because I'm sure other people want to say stuff too, but um, this is part of the reason why crypto might also become more popular for these groups over time as well. Not just for these groups, but um, for any th sort of third party country that would want to get involved is because Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain is not regulated by anyone. They, nobody can stop those transactions. They might be able to stop you cashing out through an exchange, but you can't stop that flow of money by any one third party. That's really advantageous for you know a third party state that wants to be able to get involved in this, but they're not able to do it through the financial means of the country they want to get involved in. Um, so I don't necessarily have an example I can point to right now of some big example of that, but I would not be surprised in the near future if we do see that. Okay, something to look out for. Any thoughts from anyone else before we wrap up or any last thoughts more, more broadly? I mean, we started off this discussion by perhaps cautioning that, um, as I like to say, uh, trying to uh, jam the far right square peg when it comes to financing into the jihadi round hole is perhaps not the right strategy to, to pursue. Um, Beth, your hand went up, then it went down. Uh, just feel free to come in. Oh, no, sorry. I was going to answer the question about um, uh, sort of third party or third Please do. Uh, state actors, which is just to say that I would argue that potentially that um, we would be looking more in the realm of extremism and the funding of, like you had mentioned, uh, parties or candidates who are standing for certain offices, as opposed to some of the more lone wolf terrorist, lone wolf actors, engagement in violence type things. Those will be harder for states to identify and they're not going to. I would find it very unlikely that they would send funding unclear of how that would be used again for like a car payment versus actual engagement in an attack. I do think, however, that the, the fundraising could go towards um, promoters of conspiracy theories, particularly those that relate to things like COVID or elections and for political parties. So I think that, and we should see that also as having a, a knock on effect or a domino effect towards political violence. But I would argue that probably you would see most of that um, state intervention on the level of influence on uh, conspiracy theories and on political parties, as opposed to like the fund funding directly of terrorist uh, type attack or yeah. uh, violent entities. Yes, no, I think that I think that's probably right. But of course, the funding of political parties can act as an accelerant. Um, Stephen, it uh, looks like you want to have the last word. Yeah, but if you don't mind, I mean, on the questions of pegs and holes, I think the CTF regime even when it deals with its jihadi threat, needs to really wake up and become recalibrated to the lone actor threat, as, as Beth and I have been saying. So maybe it's more about adapting CTF to lone actor terrorism as opposed to adapting it from jihadism to the far right. I think it's maybe more about the types of attacks as opposed to the ideology. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you all very much. It's really been a great uh, conversation. I've much in, enjoyed it. It's given certainly given me uh, a load of food for thought. So uh, we're coming to the end of this panel session. I should just say um, that before we conclude, if you would like to find out any more about the work we do at RUSI's Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies, then do stay in touch with us via Twitter at CFCS underscore RUSI. Uh, we have a mailing list. Um, and of course, if you're a devotee of LinkedIn, you can also find us uh, there. But I would like to conclude by thanking uh, our panelists, uh, Bethan, Brenner, Jacob, Stephen, thank you very much for your
time. Uh, I'd also like, of course, as ever, to thank the Rusi Events team for putting together what's been a, a long day uh, for, for them and to Jess and Claudia in the Terrorism and Conflict team for masterminding today's uh, conference. Uh, do stay with us. We have a, a wrap up session coming up now. Uh, I will shortly uh, be joined by my colleague, Dr. Jess White uh, and Mr. James Sullivan. Um, but with that, I bring this panel to a close. Bye for now and thank you all for joining us.